Hello, everyone, and welcome to Criminology, Chapter 1. This is based upon the third edition of Frank Smallager's book, Criminology. So, again, here's our title page. Our chapter objectives is we want to differentiate between crime, deviance, and delinquency. We explain how the consensus perspective differs from the pluralist perspective. We describe criminology and the role of criminologists. Summarize the ways that crime is reported and measured. We want to summarize statistics and trends in, in crime rates with a very brief overview of how crime has changed over say the last 100 years in the United States. Uh, statistics and trends, again in crime rates, explain how criminology works with other disciplines and impacts making laws and social policy. So first let's look at crime, deviance, and delinquency. Three very important terms when studying crime. Most of us have a general understanding of crime. Crime is defined by statutes within our country and around the world, as a matter of fact. Deviance, on the other hand, is, is really something that is dependent upon one's perspective, which we will we'll take a closer look at. Deviance to one person uh, may be perfectly normal to, to another. So we're going to try to take a closer look at that and see if we can't figure, figure that one out. And delinquency, basically, we're just talking about young people. So what is a crime? Crime is defined as human contact conduct that violates the criminal laws of a state, federal government, or a local jurisdiction that has the power to make or enforce laws. What does that mean? Well, your local government, if you live in the city of Philadelphia, or you live in southern New Jersey, or wherever it is you live around the country, those local governments have the ability to make ordinances or local laws, uh, which make certain relatively minor things illegal, although some, some cities, major cities, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, what have you, have their own laws, which may be slightly different from those of, of the states or may be more stringent than the states. An example might be Chicago. Chicago has uh, very uh, stringent gun laws where most people in the city of Chicago cannot carry firearms, but outside of the city, uh, you can. Same thing in uh, certain states around the country, other states. Philadelphia is a little bit more strict because of the size of the city. However, Pennsylvania uh, really is pretty much wide open as far as being able to get, get firearms. At the state level, each state can pass their own laws with regard to things. If we look at guns again, New Jersey has a very strict gun law, and it's almost impossible to get a carry permit for a, a private citizen, your average person. Whereas if you cross the border in Pennsylvania, it's very, very easy. Almost anyone, unless you have a criminal record or some type of mental health record, can easily get a carry permit in the state of Pennsylvania. Where in New Jersey, you actually have to prove that you have a need. There is, is some change going on in that regard, but you have to prove you have a need. So crime is socially relevant in the sense that it's created by, by the law. Federal law is, a, is another matter as well. So there are things, you look at drug laws around the country. There's a lot of move for medical marijuana. New Jersey has medical marijuana. Pennsylvania is thinking about it. Uh, and then, of course, the legalization of personal use of marijuana. Colorado, as an example, is a place where anyone can go out there and go to a store set up for this purpose and purchase, purchase marijuana. New Jersey is just putting together a bill for that purpose. Uh, the governor says he'll veto it if it ever gets to him, so who knows. Pennsylvania, there's some talk. Uh, Pennsylvania doesn't yet have a medical marijuana system, so that's still something they're talking about as well. So it kind of depends where you are as to what crime is. And on an international scale, which we may look at later on in the course, there are very different viewpoints as to what's what's correct. If we look at, at sexual assault, sexual violence, assaults on persons, 
different cultures have different ideas. So again, crime is, is a socially relevant thing. And I went back too far. Previous, all right, deviant behavior. Deviant behavior is that which violates social norms. So there's a lot of things that might be considered deviant that are not the norms of society that are not criminal. On the other hand, there are things that are that pretty much everybody considers deviant, like uh, murdering someone or molesting a 12-year-old or something like that, in, at least in our United States society, are considered deviant. Uh, on the other hand, you know, majority of the class, or about half of the people in, in class uh, last week for this particular session had tattoos, and the other half of us did not. Now, depending upon where you are, one of us might consider deviant. If I go into uh, the tattoo arts festival that's held at the convention center every year and me being without a single tattoo on me, people might look at me like, what's this guy? What's he looking for? Or, you know, if you go into a certain group, maybe you go to a church where people think it is a, a sin to, to put marks on the body. You might have the opposite effect where people think, no, you shouldn't do that. So again, it's it's relative to the culture. It's relative to the people. Uh, the next slide suggests that some people think, you know, that somebody wearing a hoodie is deviant. Well, I didn't like to wear hoodies just because they were inconvenient. And now this guy's got one with a zipper on it, so I always wear zippered sweatshirts. I never called them hoodies. Uh, what I call a hoodie is the one you yank over your head. Uh, I never wore them just because of the inconvenience of not having a zipper, if I got a little hot, I can't open it up, whatever. But this past fall, I really liked them. Now, am I deviant because now I'm wearing a hoodie? If I put the hood up because it's a little rain going on, am I considered a deviant? Someone in the discussion group in this, this class this past week talked about you know how people are so judgmental in our society that if a, a guy standing outside uh, a business all day long doing nothing but wearing a hoodie, is he, is he deviant? Now, I'm not judging by the hid, the hoodie, but the fact that he's standing out in front of the store all day long. What is he doing? You know, you got to look for some other signs of behavior. Is he just like standing out there because he's got nothing else to do? Is he standing out there selling drugs? Is he a bookie? Is is he standing out there scoping for for people to rob, or is he just some guy who's got nothing else to do? You know, it's hard to say. I like to judge people based upon behavior, not a, not upon their clothing. But in a lot of cases, especially with regard to, to clothing, whether it's the, the hoodies or the guys walking around with their pants sagging so their butt crack shows, you know, people wearing uh, various types of things, hair colors. You know, if you have your hair dyed purple, I always threaten to dye my hair purple or, or blue or something. My wife always says I can't do it. I guess she thinks it's deviant. So, you know, it's something that we live with in our society. Delinquency. What is delinquency? Violations of criminal law and other a behavior committed by young people. Basically, whenever you have a situation where someone who is under the legal age in whatever state you're in, it depends upon the state, could be 16, 17, or 18, here where, where this course is being taught, we're in, in Pennsylvania and border with the state of New Jersey, and in both states the, the legal age is 18. So anyone under the age of 18 is considered a juvenile, or some people like to use the term minor. And any crime that they commit is considered delinquency. We're not going to get into it too much in this course, but every state has an apparatus available to move those juveniles into the adult system and then charge them as criminals. But initially, they are considered delinquents rather than, than criminal. And of course, there are also certain offenses that are only illegal for children. And they're, again, they're not commit, considered crimes. And if an adult does it, no big deal. Or, you know, people might be concerned, but still, it's not illegal. So you have someone running away from home. Child who runs away from home, that's a, an illegal act. Now, what are they going to do? They're going to bring you home, take you back to your parents. If there's some issue with, with you not getting along with your parents, maybe they put you in foster care, or maybe they put you in some kind of, 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 of child home that they have set up to help. Uh, you know, foster home, halfway home, something like that, uh, even in those cases. Because if, if you can't, you know, if you're going to continue to run away from your family, that could be a problem. 
But, you know, there's been a lot of talk these days as to how we treat these kids. You know, do we put runaways in the same uh, facility that we teach, we put the kid who just robbed the 7-Eleven because they're both juveniles? There's a lot of talk about that, more relevant to our juvenile court class than this one, but we'll be talking about it later. So running away from home, being ungovernable, which simply means you're out of control in your home. Your parents can't, can't keep you under control. And you might be taken out and taken to a different type, different home with different people that maybe help you. Uh, drinking alcohol. Now, of course, many states, Pennsylvania, New Jersey included, the legal age is 21. So anybody who's under the age of 21 is considered a minor with regard to the drinking of alcohol. So all these are not necessarily considered crimes. However, in New Jersey, where, where I was a police officer, if you're between 18 and 21 and you're drinking alcohol, that is actually a criminal offense. Whereas if you're below 18, it's a juvenile offense. So you have to obviously understand the laws uh, in the place where you're going to work if you're going to work in the criminal justice system. All right, we want to look at consensus versus pluralist perspective. Uh, again, I said this was based upon uh, chapter one of Frank Smallinger's Criminology Edition 3. It's the same in Edition 2, the same uh, material. So read it very carefully. Consensus basically means that everybody in, in this society agrees on one thing. Pluralist means that we have different opinions and we go through some type of political process to determine what the laws are going to be. So consensus perspective, we all probably agree that some 35-year-old male having sex with a nine-year-old girl should be illegal. So in that respect, we have a consensus. But we all don't agree whether marijuana in quantities for personal use should be possessed. So there is a, that's a pluralist perspective where it goes through the system. And as we can see, there's, there's movement throughout our country where the pluralist perspective with regard to things like marijuana is moving more towards the yes rather than the no. So crime really can be considered differently depending upon, again, that perspective, the society. So it, there's these two conflicting points of view, the pluralist or, or the uh, consensus. So again, the consensus perspective, laws are enacted, criminalizing forms of behavior when members of society agree that such laws exist, where pluralist holds that behaviors are typically criminal through that political process after debate. Uh, if you ask many, and think about it for a moment, what do you think our American society is? Take a second, think about it. All right, have you thought about it? I bet you most of you said pluralist. And you'd probably be right, because we do have that political process and we decide uh, many things through that process. But there are also, as we stated before, many things that are viewed on a consensus perspective, at least on the whole, or for the most part. Again, that would be murder, uh, sexual assault, especially you know juveniles, or sexual assault against anyone, for a matter of fact. Although there are people that move into our country from other societies where some things are perfectly fine. There are some societies where it's perfectly fine for a man to marry a 14-year-old girl and start making babies. It's perfectly fine for a male to force his wife to have sex, where in our country, it is no longer, neither one of those things is, is permitted at this point in time. Uh, all right, so now we're going to get into some terms, and we're going to look at what criminology is and what criminologists are. And criminologist is basically that person who's studying crime, criminals, and criminal behavior. Usually it's a term that we, when we're talking about someone who's working in a college or university, who's teaching, uh, like I am, uh, people who are doing research, people are studying crime for the purpose of developing policy. You know, those are the kinds of people we're talking about. We're, talking, we're not talking about you who is presently studying criminology. You're not a criminologist. Maybe we could call you a junior criminologist. We're talking about people who, this is how they make their money. 
this is what they do. This is their career. You know, even if they are already independently wealthy and decide to study it, they're not taking money. It's what they do on a regular basis. So if at some point you decide that that's what you want to do, then that's, then you'll be a criminologist. More than likely, you're going to have to go through getting your bachelor's degree, getting a master's degree, moving on to a PhD, which is uh, what my goal is in the future. Presently, I'm a master's person. Eventually, I'd like to get a PhD, preferably in criminology, because this is you know, one of my, my favorite subjects of study. What criminologists do is they're gathering data and analyzing that data. You know, they're looking at what's going on in a particular area of society that is affecting uh, crime. They're looking at crime pattern analysis, you know, like maybe they're looking at a specific area of the city or maybe they're looking at the city like Philadelphia and trying to figure out, you know, what's going on as far as crime in the city. And they're trying to, you know, identify trends. We saw in Chicago, I had over 900 murders in Chicago uh, last year. Is that a, a blip because of, you know, something bad that was happening last year? Or is that a trend that's going to continue? I think it was 700 the year before, 900 last year. What's it going to be this year? And hopefully, I don't know, the police agencies and the DA's office and even the federal government getting involved will be doing things that, to reduce that number. But criminologists are studying that and they're looking at it. What is, what is causing this particular trend to happen? And of course, they're building theories. Theory is basically when a criminologist who studies, who does their data gathering analysis, looks at crime patterns, trend identification, and eventually develops a theory stating what they believe the cause of certain types of crime are. And what we're going to do in this particular course is we're going to spend the next six weeks looking at a variety of theories from classical and neoclassical theory next week to biological, psychological, and to various socially based structure or, or theories like social structure and social process as to how they may impact crime. And in each one, you had criminologists or people studying who said, it's that. You know, it's because of brain injury. It's because of heredity. It's because of how the person was raised in the home. And they developed theories based upon that. They, criminologists come up with hypothesis. You know, we think that it looks like A, if you have A happen and B happen together, then C happens. And they, they look at that. So a, a hypothesis might be in the summer it gets hot and ice cream sales go up and there's more crime. Well, is the fact that there's more crime based upon ice cream sales? So we have to develop a hypothesis and then they have to test that as a hypothesis. And obviously they're going to find out that crime and ice cream sales are just things that happen to be correlated, but they're not causative. So criminologists are, are coming up with those different hypotheses and then trying to figure out what really is the causative situation. Uh, they're involved in the creation of social policy. They're involved in public advocacy, maybe advocating for certain groups of people based upon what they've found out in their study. They're involved in public service, helping people, and they're studying the normal and abnormal social behaviors. Some of the other things they do is they're giving scholarly, scholarly presentations and, and writing publications. So a criminologist may appear at an annual convention of a certain group, whether it's a criminologist group or a police group or a lawyer's group, and they will give a presentation based upon what they have studied and what they have found out based upon their studies. They also are involved in education and training. You know, in your larger colleges and universities, you have PhD criminologists who are teaching courses at a high level. Maybe they're teaching master's students. Maybe they're working with PhD candidates. Uh, maybe they're even working with bachelor students as well. Depending on what school you're going to, you have access to people of that high caliber. And they may also be involved in training. You know, a large city who is having a, a significant issue with crime and violence may enlist the aid of a criminologist to come to their city and train their officers in some, some ideas that they've come up with. They're also involved in threat assessment and risk analysis. They may also serve as expert witnesses at trial or in other court proceedings, either on the defense or, or the prosecutorial side. 
All right, criminalist. So this word is thrown in here because we don't want people to can be confused. You know, we're talking about criminology and criminologists in this course. Then there's this term criminalist. What does it mean? Well, criminalist is basically the person who is specializing in the collection and examination of physical evidence of a crime. So you have your crime scene investigator, you have your forensics people. The criminalist, by this definition, would be the person who is collecting that that material. So it might be your crime scene investigator might also be concerned a criminalist, but then also the person in the lab who you give that information to or give that material to who's then going to take a look at it and, and make some judgments or make some comparisons or something with that. That's a criminalist. All right. Not really the focus of this course, but we need to clarify that term just in case so people don't get confused. And another term, criminal justice professional. Criminal justice professional is just a blanket term. It's like a, a basket that we're going to put everybody else in. So those of us that are police officers, corrections officers, or corrections professionals, probation and parole officers, criminal defense attorneys, prosecutors, anybody who's doing the day-to-day -day work of the criminal justice system. I understand in our course we have someone who's working in the criminal justice center. Uh, you didn't mention what your role is, but you might be considered a criminal justice professional because you're working in the criminal courts. The judges, all criminal justice professionals to some degree. All right, so criminology is an interdisciplinary profession that's built on scientific study of crime and criminal behavior. You now we're looking at how does this happen? That's the manifestation. We're looking at causes. We're looking at legal aspects and control. So criminology is looking at whatever comes together and, and becomes crime. And we're also looking at solutions to crime. So if we can figure out what causes crime, then hopefully we can figure out what we can do to offset those causes and provide some solutions. And it's interdisciplinary because it means that it's not just like there's this criminology people. No, there's all kinds of people that are involved from various disciplines, whether it's forensic anthropology, whether it's a psychiatrist or psychologist or biologists, you know, all kinds of people coming from all kinds of, of places to talk about crime and figure out what the causes of crime. You know, social people who are sociologists looking at the movement and interaction of groups, all these things help us to try to understand crime. It's almost like in one of my textbooks a few years ago, which I probably have it right behind us here, but I don't want to pull it out and throw it up on the screen, showed that criminology was basically a tabletop. And the legs of the table, it was like eight to 12 legs of this table were all these different scientific disciplines that supported the, the table. It contributes to the discipline in criminal justice because criminologists are studying, you know, what's, what's crime all about, while criminal justice people are applying the law and working through the various components of the system. Criminology helps that by helping us to understand what is it that's causing these criminal acts to occur. So let's... Let's look a little bit about at theoretical criminology. What are we talking about? We're talking about these folks that are studying crime and criminals, and they're trying to explain why th this occurs. You know, they're not just saying, hey, you know what? There was a robbery at the Slev 11 down the street. Somebody shot the clerk. They took off. The cops caught him. No, they're looking more deeply into that. All right, there was a robbery at the 7 Eleven. And Joey, the bad guy with the gun, he just had a fight with his wife. He was really mad. She threw him out of the house. He didn't have any money, but he did have a gun. And he just went off, and he went over to the store because he needed some money, and he decided to hold up the clerk. The clerk fought him off, and the guy shot him. You know, they're looking at it in more, more deeply, but then they're going to go even deeper than that. What is it that, that caused Johnny to react in that way? Because not every guy who gets thrown out of his house after a fight with his wife goes and robs a 7-Eleven and shoots the clerk. So criminologists are looking at that more deeply and trying to figure out what gets certain people 
to go and commit these crimes, while other people who might be in similar situations or raised a certain way or come from the same family genetics don't. And then, of course, they develop theories and they come up with a bunch of ideas or propositions suggesting various relationships or you know, what causal relationships might occur between events and the occurrences that they are studying. Two ways to look at it, general theory of crime is when you have someone who is doing their study and they say, well, you know what, it's all about the fact that all these people live in this terrible neighborhood and that's why there's crime. They think there's only one cause or it's all about genetics. You know, when we look at biological theories in a couple of weeks, there were actually biological theorists who believed that committing crime was something that came up because of what was passed down from your ancestors, that people that were more high born and people who came from, from better stock didn't commit crimes. That was a biological theory. And there was a lot of other things that we're gonna look at more deeply. Uh, integrated theory is looking how various causes or various inputs may lead to crime. It, it, ver it looks at a whole lot of different sources. And it doesn't always explain all criminality, but it gives us a better idea that what happened to that Johnny Jones who went into the 7-Eleven, robbed it, and shot the clerk? What happened before he went? What happened when he was growing up? Where did he grow up? Did he have any significant issues with authority or with his parents or with anybody else growing up that would lead him to make this choice? Was there some kind of genetic issue? Does he have, does he have a, a current brain injury? We're going to look at, Look at that in a couple weeks down the road is how some people, there have been cases of people with tumors who have changed behavior drastically after the tumor developed. And then when the tumor gets removed, they go back to normal. So integrated theory would be looking at all kinds of different causes and concerns. So crime basically is a social construction. Again, it's, we define it in our legal basis but it also has measurable costs to individual victims and society as a whole. Uh, one of my students in a, in a session recently in a paper said that, that there were no victims to shoplifting and therefore suggesting there's no victims, I guess there's no cost, but think about it. You go into the Best Buy and you are interested in a certain DVD movie that for some reason you can't seem to get on Netflix. You're not able to get on your Comcast or you don't feel like paying for it at Comcast and you go in and you happen to see it prominently displayed on the shelf in the Best Buy. You say, you know, I really want to see that movie. But you know what, it's $14.99 and I only got $12 in my pocket and I decide to steal it. Now, my one student last session said that there was no victim. Well, what about the Best Buy? Didn't Best Buy pay for that particular DVD? Now it's $14.99 for you to buy it they must have paid something for it. Did they pay $5? Did they pay $10? Whatever. It's costing the store. The store had to put some kind of security measures possibly, or they will put security measures on it. Maybe the price goes up because more than likely you're not the only shoplifter that came in that store and stole something. If it wasn't for shoplifters, would they have the guys in the yellow shirts at the front door of the, of the, uh, the Best Buy to make sure that you're not taking out anything that you, did, that you don't own? No. So that's, all, that's cost, so that's measurable. If someone gets, gets shot on the street, obviously there's going to be significant social costs within the family if that person dies or they're seriously injured. There's also gonna be cost if that person is, is someone who's supporting a family and now the money that that person would have brought into the family is not there. And if that person dies, Maybe the rest of the family has to figure out how, how to make money to support themselves, or maybe they lose their house because they lost their father figure, whoever it was. Now, there's all kinds of costs. There's going to be the medical costs. Even after somebody dies, there's still medical bills. And it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes, especially with, with trauma and trauma centers, to, to treat some of these patients. So there's all kinds of costs that way. So... Crime has costs for all of us. You now, if there's crime in our neighborhood, are we buying more security devices? Are we putting alarm systems up? Are we doing things, even though the crime hasn't directly affected us, we're out spending money. 
you know, I recently put cameras around my house because I had some young people who decided they wanted to vandalize my property. You know, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have to spend you know, three fifty to four hundred dollars worth on cameras that I'm now having to also waste time monitoring. So there's a cost. Obviously, different people look at things differently. We talked about marijuana laws. Uh, different groups feel different socially about whether it's okay to steal from people. You know, is it okay to beat up a guy who caused problems for someone else? You know, if a, if a drug dealer is defending his turf, is it okay to rob another drug dealer? You know, just examples, some basic examples. It's called social relativity. People look at things based upon what's relative to them. What makes sense to them? How is society, their culture, or, or how they were raised? That's social relativity. All right, notion that social events are interpreted differently according to cultural experience and personal be interests of the initiator, observer, or recipient of that behavior. Consider this example. If, no doubt, it's the weekend, Friday night, Saturday night, somebody got shot in Philadelphia. All right, it made the news. Maybe the only people that are really upset about it are the neighbors, the people who live in the area, and maybe because their kid could have got shot, whatever. But it's not like spread all over the place and, and a big deal. And somebody gets shot on a street in the suburbs where it never happens. And all hell breaks loose because it's like, oh my goodness, this a murder in, in Nice Town or whatever. So social relativity. We see it every single day. I had one of my students who lives in Trenton that says there are people getting shot all the time in Trenton, but it's never in the news. That's social relativity. And it might also be, for whatever reason, the media is not paying attention. But we react to things based upon our own experiences. This is just a, an example. I would read the book around this, and it, basically it just shows us what are the contributions of each part of the criminal justice system, you know, the offender, society itself, the victim, the justice system, uh, towards this criminal event. So it's contributions and interpretations of various people in society. And it just shows us that we all have some type of input or there's an output from it. For the most part, for the last 30 to 40 years, criminology has been considered a social science discipline very strongly. When we look at social process and social structure theories later in the course, they have really dominated. People thinking that, that crime is based upon how one was raised or how the society is structured around you or how the society affected you as you interacted with it has been the big part of study of criminology over the last 30 plus years. Uh, I know when I was in my bachelor's program years ago, that's what it was all about. Uh, we didn't really talk much about uh, crime based upon anything other than sociological theories. And my criminal justice program was in the sociology department of my college. So today we're looking more interdisciplinary, and we're going to talk later on in the course about some folks uh, active today, like Adrian Raines at the University of Pennsylvania, who is looking at some uh, biological impacts that are very relevant today. So we'll be looking more into this inter inter interdisciplinary and realize that it's not about just one thing. There is no one cause, and it's not just the way someone was raised. It's not just the neighborhood they live in, because every single one of us can look and see that in the neighborhoods that we grew up in, whether we live in a nice, quiet neighborhood like I live in, or we live in, in some place that's like the Wild West every Saturday night, we know that there are people who grow up in those neighborhoods that are very, very good, and there are some people that have committed some really terrible atrocities. and in, how did that happen based upon where they are? So it's not always that. Next, we want to move into how crime is reported and measured. And you're already talking about this in this discussion group, and we'll get through it kind of quickly. 
there are some really great resources that are placed in the, uh, the doc share on this. And one of our students, Charles Lawson, also provided a really good article in the discussion on this. So please take a look at it. So we basically have, have three, I'd say two, but they say three major ways to measure crime in our country today. And that, are, that is the NCVS, which stands for the National Crime Victimization Survey, the UCR, which is a Uniform Crime Report, and NIBRS, which is the National Incident-Based Reporting System. Now, I say it's only two because NIBRS is really an offshoot or an addition to the UCR. So let's look at those a little more closely. Our National Crime Victimization Survey is information from interviews of people around the country. They interview a whole bunch, I think it's like 12 to 15,000 households. Uh, the data is available. If you wanna know exactly how this is done, I posted a link to the website for this survey in the doc sharing or in the webliography it is. That's where the link is, in the webliography. And you can actually go and read about how this thing is conducted, look at some sample questions, et cetera. But they interview people, randomly selected households throughout the nation. So. They're getting information if they say somebody called you on the phone and asked you who you were voting for last, last October and you told them, or they ask you a bunch of questions about public policy and you asked the, you answered the questions. That's what these people are doing. They're either going to somebody's home with their clipboard and asking them all the questions or they're calling them on the phone and asking them all the questions and they're getting that, that information from, from these people that way. So it's not like they're getting at, reporting of crime as it happens, they're calling people afterwards and they're asking them, hey, were you a crime victim? Maybe the person says yes. Were you a victim of rape, robbery, sexual assault, whatever? And a person maybe then lists what they were. So it's considered more accurate than the UCR because one of the things that we're getting is crimes that may have not been reported uh, to the police. Now they're treating a, crime, a, a household as an individual unit, so they're talking and they're asking if anybody in your household may be involved in certain crimes. And the way they see it is, is it's quite possible that we're getting more information about crimes that, that nobody knows about. And therefore, this could be more accurate. The type of crimes that they're looking for, rape, personal robbery, aggravated assault, simple assault, household burglary, personal and household theft, and motor vehicle theft. Now one of the issues, of course, is Crimes are defined by statute in every state in our country. And this is a national study that is sponsored by the federal government, the Bureau of Justice Statistics. So you may have some definitional issues. You know, the term rape, as an example, is not even used in many states now within their criminal statute. So you would ask someone if they were raped and they might say yes, but then you'd have to define what that actually means. And there are also various definitions of, of rape. Uh, many years ago, and we, we'll see this later on in the course, you know, a man who forcibly had sex with his wife, it was not considered a rape. Whereas if you're that female, you would consider it a rape, even though the statute may not. Now, now all states do consider it that, but a lot of states don't use the term rape, they use the term sexual assault. So there are some definitional issues where there might be some confusion because it's not going to be the same as, as what the criminal code in each state might have. So you might also have over-reporting. Maybe someone says, you know, you say, well, how many times has someone broken into your car? And maybe they only had it happen once, but they decided to say six. Somebody, you know, talk about whether they were assaulted or not. And they, it might have been two or three times, and they say 12. So the issue is when you're doing a survey, any kind of survey, you really have no way of knowing whether the te person's telling you the truth or not. So it's kind of like the honor system. So you could be getting good informa information, and, but you don't know for sure. And again, I already, already talked about that not, al not always do NCVS crimes meet the statutory definitions. All right, the Uniform Crime Report. Charles had a really good... Uh, paragraph on this in the discussion group. Basically, it was developed by the FBI to collect crime statistics from various police agencies, and it was to help the agencies and policymakers 
we can see that we had so many of this type of crime in a certain year, maybe we need to be doing something about it. Now, the Uniform Crime Report was developed initially to do this. Now in a lot of agencies, you actually have live collection of data where they're looking at it on a daily basis and seeing, you know, is there a spike in Kensington of, of, of drug overdoses? Is there, you know, more uh, robberies going on in Center City? And you see that right away. So there's a lot of live measurement of crime going on now. This is the Uniform Crime Report is more of a static system of, of collection of data for the year. Now, some states will post monthly reports, so you can actually go on a website and see it. Uh, but the major reports that come out in the Uniform Crime Report are coming out on a yearly basis at the state and the federal level. The crimes measured, the primary, uh, what they call part one offenses measured by the UCR, are murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny, motor vehicle theft, and arson. Uh, notice that in the National Crime Victimization Survey, one thing that they did not measure was murder. And why was the NCVS not measuring murder? Because they're interviewing people about crimes that occurred to them. Obviously, your murder victim is not gonna be able to provide you data on their murder. So NCVS doesn't measure murders, UCR does. And you're gonna have some differentiation in what's reported because some people don't report certain crimes. Uh, pervasive in our society, whether it's embarrassment or a fear of retribution or, or whatever, fear of ridicule, is rape has gone underreported. We see that it's been increasing as we have more uh, victim advocacy groups and more groups working with, with women, but not generally reported. And certainly, and now in, in, in many states, the sexual assault statutes will include men. You probably don't have a lot of men that are coming forward and reporting if they were uh, sexually assaulted. All right, sometimes robberies go unreported. Let's say if you're the drug dealer in the corner and you get robbed of the $1,200 you had in your pocket, are you going to call the cops and say, you know what, I was dealing drugs in the corner and somebody stole my dough? Probably not. Sometimes assaults don't get reported. Uh, aggravated assaults should probably for the most part get reported because in an aggravated assault usually there's some kind of injury but under state statute in some states just the fact that somebody points a gun at you is considered aggravated assault and i had a a friend post on facebook just just yesterday as, that their neighbor in their apartment that they lived in pointed a gun at them they had a dispute the person pointed a gun at them and they didn't know what to do should they call the police should they not call the police you know the the landlord says not to the landlord says to deal with it so if they follow the landlord's advice here we had an aggravated assault occurred if a person pointed a gun at somebody and that's going to go unreported and of course many since this was posted on facebook many people including myself advise this person that they should report it but these things happen every single day and people don't know what to do. I see that a lot, especially in some of the community groups I belong to, where people were saying, hey, this happened, what do I do? Because they don't know. And if they didn't have people to help them, they wouldn't tell. Burglaries, whether it be of a house or a car or whatever, sometimes go unreported because you know if the, if the volume or the value of the theft wasn't that great, people don't want to be bothered with it. You know, if you came out to your car in the morning and somebody went into your car because you forgot to lock the door and they stole the, the three dollars worth of quarters you had in your ashtray, are you going to call the police? I say most of you will say no. When I was a police officer working in a, in a suburban community, I always said you should because how do I know to patrol your neighborhood to be looking for these things if nobody bothers to tell us what's going on? So these things... There's a lot of things. Larceny is is of, is woefully underreported, even though it is the largest number of crimes reported are larcenies. Larceny is just another word for theft, for those of you that don't know what that word means. Uh, motor vehicle theft, more than likely most motor vehicle thefts, just like murders, are reported. Because somebody steals your car, you're probably going to report it, unless, of course, it was already a stolen car or it was illegal or something like that. Uh, for the most part, motor vehicle thefts are going to be reported. So 2005, FBI got rid of a term called the crime index, was basically a number that they assigned to, to crimes. Uh, part one offenses are broken into violent and property crimes, which you could probably guess, you just looked at the list, 
This is the breakdown. Part one being uh, violent personal crimes being murder, rape, aggravated assault, and robbery. Property offenses being burglary, motor vehicle theft, larceny, and arson. They also publish a report called the annual, called the crime in the United States. And like I said, in the webliography, there's a link to this information at the FBI website, and you can look at the report for 2016, which is already posted. Usually they post them in June. I believe there's already data there for 2016. It may not be complete yet, but they're getting it up faster and faster because the data collection and the, the use of, of computers is making it that much faster. You know, back before we had all this wonderful technology, understand that I started being a police officer in 1984. We didn't have computer-based reporting of this information. And so it literally did take six months to collate all the data and put it in some kind of report that people could read. Now it doesn't take that long. So many, much of your data is already there, so you can go look at it. They also report information on crimes that were cleared. Clear defense is simply something where someone, where it's been solved. We know who did it. You know, we, a lot of times the clearance will be that we arrested somebody, but it might also be that we know who it is, but we can't get them. So let's say like that person who, who shot and killed the Delaware State Trooper a few weeks back. He was eventually located in his home. He didn't want to get arrested, and he eventually, after an overnight, actually I think it was two nights, of of keeping himself barricaded in the house, he came out shooting and he got shot and he died. That case is cleared even though he wasn't arrested. The clearance rate is proportion of reported or discovered crimes within a given offense category that are solved. So if you had, let's say you had 10 murders in your community, you solve nine of them, that's 90% clearance rate. If you solve all 10 of them, that's 100% clearance rate. If you only solve two, that's 20%. So. The math's not too complicated. I base it on, on 10 or 100 to make it simple for you. Criticisms, UCR is only based on reported crimes. So there's a lot of crimes and some people say about as, as much as 50% are not reported. So it's criticized for underestimating true incidents of criminal activity. So we could look and say, hey, you know, there were 1,500 burglaries in Philadelphia last year. And maybe there were actually 3,000 of them because 1,500 people didn't bother to report. Nibbers is an enhancement of the UCR. This Nibbers system collects more details. So someone in the, in the, uh, the group who was saying that they said the UCR was collected data on what type of gun was used. Actually, the UCR doesn't do that. It's Nibbers that does that. Nibbers is the one who's, who's looking at the relationships between people, looking, you know, what kind of firearm was used, what kind of property was it that got broken into, what kind of car was it. All that detail and data is being collected and forwarded all, into, all the way up to the FBI so then researchers can go and use that data to try to see, see trends based upon the data. It uses uh, 22 crime categories, single incident and arrest, and it gets into, like I said, very detailed incident victim property offender arrestee information and relationships all kinds of stuff it's trying to make these things this data more useful because if i know and i put in my burglary report there was a single family residence got broken into uh, this type of tool was used and i put all that in my crime report but it doesn't go anywhere how do we draw comparisons around the country and find out that, you know what, the majority of our burglaries are using Craftsman number seven screwdrivers. Nibbers is gonna help us with stuff like that. Statistics and trends, real quickly. We've had various crime, changes in crime patterns over the years in our country, 33 to 59, and this is all in, in the 1900s, last, last century. And, you know, to me it's, I was born in 1960, so it's not so ancient to me. To some of you, it's a world away. But 33 to 59, two big things happened. We had the World War II, and we also had the Korean War. And, of course, when you have wars, you got to send all the young boys over to fight, and those are also the majority of people who commit crimes. So crime decreased sharply during that time. 60 to 1989 is you know, the, 
the 60s, maybe even the late 50s, baby boomer time, more uh, unrest in our society because of the Vietnam War, 80s, the crack epidemic, increase in most forms of crime. 90 to present, we've seen a decrease relatively uh, across the board, decrease in crime. Although there have been some major spikes like Chicago last year with over 900 murders. And some folks think that we ought to be looking at a, a, a next group of patterns because they believe that there's going to be an increase. So let's wait and see. Uh, there have been some, like I said, some spikes, but still crime, if you actually look at the data, you can go look at the UCR data. They do charts that show you crime over the last 10, 20, 30 years. And you can see that crime overall has decreased in those periods. Is that some people think there's going to be a, a swing, an upswing? I don't know. How can they explain it? They're going to look at the various things that are going on. Are we backing off because of, of money things and we're not interacting with the community? Is it because there's more attention to uh, violence between the community and police? You know, there's a lot of different things that are going on in our society today. And I think one of the big things is there's so much so much fighting between groups in our society, which might tend to, to lead to more, more criminal acts. And I think we need to get a handle on that and hopefully prevent this upswing that some people think is gonna happen. All right, unreported crimes, important term to know, dark figure of crime, basically are those crimes that are not reported. When we're talking about the UCR, we acknowledge that some people think that up to 50% of our crimes go unreported. So let's say in any one community, you had 5,000 crimes reported, the dark figure could be three to 5,000 more that never got reported. One way they figure this out is they do self-report surveys, so they'll talk to, to people and get a history of crimes that they've been involved in, crimes maybe that they've never been caught for, crimes that were, for whatever reason were never reported, and they find out that there are a lot more. Now, this self-reporting has come kind of critic has been criticized because it's usually only they're talking about minor offenses. Usually, they're talking to juveniles, focused on juvenile delinquency. And again, we don't know whether these people that are are telling us about the crimes they're involved in are just you know making a big story because they want to make themselves look like they're cool or they're tough or whatever, or this is really what happened. All right, criminology, as I said, it's, it's integrated. You also have the term translational, which translates research findings into the field of practical and workable policy initiatives. Basically, we want to apply criminology to the problems that we are studying and try to develop policy from it. One of the big problems I see with regard to criminologists coming up with ideas and turning that into policy is sometimes our politicians don't want to hear it. Maybe what the criminologist comes up with is, is not popular and political people don't agree with it. Well, translational criminology is the effort to try to push. You know, we worked really hard to figure out that this really might be the cause of crime. And if you do something about this cause, you're going to have a better result. Evidence-based criminology is basically just doing our studies of crime with rigorous scientific techniques. Have randomized controlled experiments and systematic review of research results. Is not just saying, hey, you know what? Looks like there's a lot of this going on and this must be the cause. No, having strict scientific research to really get good results. What we really want out of this if we have good quality criminological research, then hopefully we can have effective policies come out of it. So summaries, to summarize, acts are not criminal unless they're defined. So law, some people would say law creates crime. Not all deviance is criminal. Certainly there's plenty of things that one might consider deviant. You know, if you go into a Quaker meeting house and talk about alcohol, not a good thing. You know, so different people have different perspectives. Again, consensus versus pluralist, two distinct viewpoints on which behavior should be criminal. Our society has a little bit of both. 
because certainly there are some things in our society that we all agree on that should be criminal, and there are other things that there's a, a lot of disagreement on. Criminology is scientific study. Criminologists are credentialed individuals, masters or PhD, usually PhD people, and they're spending most of their time studying. And we definitely want to look to criminology for answers to how to prevent crime. We really need criminology to help us understand the nature of crime. We have to understand how crime statistics are gathered, how they affect our understanding of crime, and how they are assessed. So got to look at, at where is this stuff coming from? To really understand why it exists, we got to get in, into the nitty gritty. Criminology works with other disciplines. It impacts social policy. As I said earlier, three major shifts in crime rates, and we've, we've pretty much talked about them. So this concludes this lecture on chapter one of Frank Smallager's Criminology, third edition. As always, if you have any questions or problems, please give me a call. Uh, my number and email are all available in the course syllabus, and I hope to hear from you soon in a discussion group. Thank you all, and have a wonderful day. All right, so we're going to close this now, and everybody take care.